So here's the poem, Auguries of Innocence uh, by William Blake. I want to talk about this one. I think students usually have a lot of success in analyzing this particular poem uh, because it's so long, like my hair used to be. Yes, there's some commitment. <laughs> Uh, uh, it, it's the longest of the poems that we read. And so there's a lot of evidence you can talk about. The more you say in your post, usually the more or the better your grade. Uh, so keep talking about things. Don't assume that you've said everything there is to say. Uh, keep writing. Give more examples from the text. Give more points of discussion. So in a poem... A poem usually has a thesis. It makes an argument. Um, and then usually a poem will give examples to prove that argument. So the thesis or argument of this poem is probably contained within the first few lines here. Uh, Blake's auguries or omens or interpretations of innocence. We know this poem has something to say. The thematic topic, one of the thematic topics, is something about innocence. And... Uh, you know, auguries can mean signs or omens or interpretations of innocence. So all of these are signs of innocence that we know we're going to be seeing throughout this poem right here. They're going to be examples of innocence. The poem has something to say about innocence. That's one of the thematic topics. But any poem, any story is going to have lots of thematic topics. It's up to you to choose which one you found to be the most interesting or prevalent in the work. So he starts out, the speaker starts out by saying, to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven and a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. So imagine these images right here. There's several images and images are pictures in a poem that you're supposed to think about and picture in your mind. You're supposed to picture a grain of sand in the palm of your hand. Okay, a picture, wildflower. And in these two things, in the smallest of things, a grain of sand, you're supposed to imagine the whole world in that grain of sand. In a wildflower, you're supposed to imagine heaven itself. Okay, so just in one hand, you hold a grain of sand. In the other hand, you hold a wildflower. And in your left hand, you're holding the whole world. And in your right hand, you're holding all of heaven. In these two things, you are holding all of eternity. So what he's saying there is he's saying that everything in the world, everything that we experience and everything in heaven itself is contained in every particular, every single object. In my mouse right here, I can find heaven itself. In my coffee cup right here, I can find the world itself. Everything is related. We're all intertwined, is what he's saying. We're all equal. Okay? There's not one thing that is greater than another. In every person, in every soul, we can find an, an, an infinity of experience. So what does that mean? Let's break it apart a little bit. Looking at some of these examples right here that he gives to explain what he means. He's, he talks about a robin redbreast in a cage that puts all heaven in a rage. So if a robin redbreast is the same as you and me, we should be mad when a robin is mistreated, okay? Because a robin is the same as you and me, okay? When we see a dog starved at its master's gate, we should be upset because a dog, an animal, is the same as you and me. Okay? Uh, and he keeps going down and he talks about different animals. In particular, he's focusing on the mistreatment of animals. Okay? In the beginning of this poem right here, he talks about the abuse of animals. Animals are an innocent thing according to Blake, in the same way that he talked about in a different poem, how babies or children were innocent things. We are equal to babies. Some people will say a baby doesn't matter too much because a baby 
you know, can't speak, a baby has no thoughts, a baby doesn't have a job. Uh, but Blake says that a, boy, a child is innocent. Okay, a child, in a lot of ways, Blake thinks is smarter than we are. Uh, and so we shouldn't mistreat children by putting them down chimneys because they're innocent. They're just like we are, or maybe even better uh, in some ways because they're closer to innocence. Uh, and then we shouldn't mistreat animals either because some people say, well, animals aren't nothing. They're not like humans. So we, it, it doesn't matter how we treat animals, some people might say. Uh, but Blake says that we should treat them humanely. And that's one reason why I showed you that raccoon I caught right there. I mean, the raccoon I caught this morning, uh, <clears throat> I treated him as humanely as I possibly could. I live trapped him and transported him elsewhere. He was causing a nuisance. He was eating up somebody's wires in his attic. You know, they couldn't have air conditioner because it was doing all that. But instead of shooting that animal, you know, or, you know, making fun of it whenever I had it in the trap there, I, I, I spoke to it softly and gently and I, I treated it well. And, and I put it in a place where I thought it could survive somewhere else. And Blake is saying that people who mistreat animals are going to get karma. That's what the poem goes about later. It starts talking about kill not the moth nor butterfly, but the last judgment draw nigh. Okay? It talks about There'll be punishment for people who mistreat an innocent thing. And in particular, he's focusing on animals in the first part of this poem. But then he also get, begins to talk about infants and mistreating babies and stuff like that. Uh, it's, so it's not just things. It's everything in the world we should treat as if it is a part of us. It's one of the things that he's implying in this poem here. Take a look at this. He who mocks the infant's faith shall be mocked in age and death. So this is how what goes around comes around is a simple way of putting it right there, but it's more complex than that. Try to avoid when you're making thematic statements. That might be where you start uh, to say a cliche or something like that, but know that the poems have a more complex statement about what goes around comes around. Try to put it in a fresh, original way. He who mocks the infant's face shall be mocked in death. So the poem has something to say about mocking people uh, who perhaps we perceive are not as good as we are. So not only mocking, it's bad to mock an infant, but it's also bad to mock people in old age. He who shall teach the child to doubt, the rotting grave shall never get out. The child's toys and the old man's reasons are the fruits of the two seasons. So Blake says that there are good things to gain from our innocence and our youth and our being as a child. But he also talks about some of the positives of old age and reason and things like that. I'm going to touch on that later. Uh, <clears throat> and at toward the end of the poem now is where we're looking. He seems to say that. We're all in this together in the same way that's like the hashtag of the COVID uh, experience, right? He says, we're all in this together. If we can see that, you know, we're all of the same thing. We, we all are in the same experience of sorrow. We're all born to sorrow, but at the same time, we're all born to delight. You should see one person as a part of you rather than separate from you. That's kind of what he's saying right here. Some of us are born to misery. Some of us are born to sweet delight. But if we can see that we're all in this together, then we won't dehumanize other people. We won't see them as Republican or Democrat, black or white or anything like that. Uh, we'll see them as <clears throat> us. When I look at that person over there on the other side of the room, when I look at a student, I'll see that that student is like me. It's a part of me. When that student looks at me, I'll see that I'm a part of him or her. So that's what he's saying right there. Uh, and that's one of the things he's saying. And so all of this bleeds into 
some of the poems that he has that talks about particular people in the society in which he lives who he sees are suffering. And I read you, I let you read some of these poems. Also, as uh, remember that the remember that uh, the quiz asks you to talk about some of the illustrations in these poems and how they add to the interpretation of meaning. So I'm going to let you look at some of the some of Blake's illustrations. I really love Blake as much as a painter as I do a poet. Uh, to see his illustrations, this is the William Blake module right here. You scroll down to the bottom and there's a link right here to the Blake archive. And you'll see uh, some of his various illustrations in this archive. Uh, I'm going to bring up some of the illustrations that I think are important. So this is one of this is the frontispiece to Songs of Innocence, that book right there. We see we have a mother and children uh, coming toward her. Pay attention when you try to interpret a painting or an engraving in this case right here or a drawing uh, to the subtle symbolic implications of that drawing. Uh, so here we have an image of children who are relying on their mother, and the mother is fostering their care, might be one way to interpret this. But we also have a lot of natural imagery in a lot of these songs of innocence as well. A tree uh, curling up these little kind of threatening tendrils of leaves uh, coming around. Then we have the frontispiece to the songs of experience. And on this one, we have two people mourning over the death of loved ones in old age. So in one instance, we have people fostering living people. And in another, we have people grieving dead people. But both of these things are essential aspects of human experience. Uh, grief, by grief, by grieving, we relate to other people. We show that we care about them. So grieving is not a bad thing. It's an essential part of experience. Once we realize that this is our way of showing care for another individual, even if they're dead, we realize that there's some subtle hint of joy in grief. That's one of the things that it says in Auguries of Innocence, that in every, we are born to joy and woe. So in every experience of woe, there's a subtle thread of joy. In every, every experience of joy, there's a subtle thread of woe. And realizing both of these things can help us to be better individuals in a lot of ways. This image right here is the image that accompanies the introduction to Songs of Innocence that I had you to read. Uh, and if you read that poem, you know there's a little babe who's inspiring the poet to sing songs of joy. Here we have the little babe who is naked, and a lot of uh, Blake's uh, <clears throat> and a lot of Blake's uh, drawings, the people are naked. He draws a lot of nudes, and the reason is not because he's a pervert or something like that. The reason is because he believes that the human body, as it's born in its most natural state, is free. Is the most beautiful because it's free of the clothes of woe. Okay, these clothes are imprisoning me in a type of way. These clothes, uh, when we're born, we're free. We're completely free of clothes, and clothes are an image of confinement to Blake. Uh, they're an image of pain in a lot of ways to him. And so, even though this person is clothed, uh, it's the clothes are very, they're not confining, they show his natural uh, body underneath. And then we have lambs of innocence in the background, okay? Uh, <clears throat> also though, it should be noted that even though these are songs of innocence, look how dark these trees are right here. So there's a subtle hint of darkness, even though it's innocent, there's a subtle hint of darkness in the background. And notice how these trees are kind of coming around and threatening to confine uh, these people right here, uh, the, the child and the poet. 
So there's a threat of confinement, even though uh, this, the song is overall pretty happy. There's a subtle threat in the background here. This is the uh, image to the poem I talked about the other day, London. So I talked about London and I talked about how it, it, how it represented a lot of the things that Blake saw that grieved him in society, in a modern industrial society. This poem connects to this previous poem right here. This image connects to this image right here. See, we have the little child leading the old man here. This is from Songs of Experience, and this one's from Songs of Innocence. This is the same person, the same child. Child is leading the old man here. The child is showing the old man all these visions. And there's a reason for that, because sooner or later, what goes around comes around, and our world is cyclical. If we go out to London and we see all of these things that depress us and make us feel sad, it should be remembered that there are moments of joy. And we talked about infant joy. Look at this moment, at, at this painting that accompanies the poem Infant Joy. All these poems that we're reading, this is how they were originally portrayed. Blake uh, carefully engraved them onto these plates of uh, copper, I believe it was. Uh, look at this beautiful image here. We have the mother and the child encased within this flower. A flower usually represent a blooming flower represents birth, okay? Uh, but at the same time, this th flower, you see how the tendrils are kind of threatening to close on the child to encase it? And then look in the background and we see a wilting flower. Uh, so Blake is, in the imagery, Blake is, even though this poem is very happy, Blake is subtly reminding us that we're all born to woe at the same time. And these are things that we need to remember in order to have a full experience of life. Here is the image that accompanies infant sorrow. Uh, <clears throat> so in this poem, when we read it, it, looked, it sounded really, you know, like a bad time was happening. You know, it was pretty awful things going on. But look at the image of the mother right there, reaching out to comfort the child. And she's kind of got a smile there on her face is how I perceive it, somewhat of a smile. She's reaching out to comfort this crying child. And so Blake is subtly implying by combining these this text with this image that even though birth can be an awful, terrifying experience, the way we can overcome these things is by showing care and compassion to others like a mother does to a little baby child. See how the child is reaching out toward the heavens? It's like he's born to die, but in death is not does not have to be an awful thing. Death can be a relieving thing. Heaven can be a re relieving thing. That's exactly right. Uh, so Bailey adds, when talking about death, the joy in death could be knowing that our loved ones are in a better place. And Blake believed in heaven. Not all people believe in heaven, but Blake believed in heaven but his belief in heaven is a pretty complex belief. When we, when we read that poem, Auguries of Innocence, remember that he said you can see heaven in a wild flower. So for Blake, heaven can be here on earth itself. Uh, we can find heaven on earth. We don't have to wait until we get to uh, another place. If we look close enough, we can find heaven in a wild flower. Uh, <clears throat> Let me transition a little bit uh, to <clears throat> Blake's discussion of, or Blake's feelings, since we're talking about heaven and religion and stuff like that. Let me talk a little bit about Blake's feelings about religion. Uh, Blake was a great admirer of Jesus Christ. Uh, he saw in the figure of Christ, uh, and it's not because he's a devout Christian. Uh, he 
would not be in any way, as a matter of fact, uh, toward the regular church at the time, he probably would see, be seen uh, as, you know, uh, an infidel or something like that, uh, because he hated the church, okay? He hated uh, what the church was doing to innocent young children. Uh, he hated what uh, the church was doing and controlling people, like the people in the church themselves. And this poem, Holy Thursday, kind of represents that right there. He saw the priests who were in power. He saw the pope who was in power uh, as people who were abusing uh, the people who were underneath them. It might relate to, you know, modern sex scandals and stuff like that uh, in the Catholic Church. I don't know that Blake is talking about that so much, so much as the way in which uh, the people in the church were so obsessed with money. In particular, he saw money as a very evil, a corrupting thing. Money is not something that is in nature. It's not something that we're born with. It's something that society or man creates. It's not natural. And the fact that our society inspires us to fall after money as like one of our most basic driving forces, Blake feels corrupts us, okay? And <clears throat> that's one of the things that he sees as one of the worst things uh, in the modern church is that money corrupts us. Um, I'm trying to see some of these poems. Let's start with The Chimney Sweeper. This is in, in this poem, we can see one of the ways uh, uh, this one is a little black thing among the snow. I had you to read two of these poems. In this poem, I think we can see one of the ways that Blake feels that money or the drive for money, which is encouraged by both the state, our modern society and the church in a lot of ways, not all churches, but for the most part, Blake saw it. Uh, he sees how ec this drive for economic gain uh, hurts little innocent little children. Okay, and if you remember the words of Christ in Matthew nineteen fourteen, uh, here are several different translations of Matthew nineteen fourteen. Uh, when the disciples of Jesus uh, were trying to keep the children from bothering Jesus. Jesus said, uh, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such of these. And other translations say, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these children. Blake very much appreciated those words right there. And this is one of the reasons why he admired Christ, is because Christ in this instance here says that heaven is closer to people who see through the eyes of little children than anything else because they're innocent, because they're innocent of money. They don't care or know about money. It's one thing that they're innocent of. And then sexual desires just to use other people for their own sexual gain. We'll take a look at another poem that talks about that in a moment. In the case of here, we see parents using little children to get money. Now, I'm not sure that Blake, um, you know, Blake knew that a lot of these people they had to, you know, that was the only way that they could feed themselves. They were barely feeding themselves already, and they had to put the children to work in order to get enough money. But then we have industrial society who is forcing these people to do that because they're not paying them a livable wage. Okay, they don't that they don't have enough food on the table, so they this they have to go to things like this in order to feed themselves. So we. Because of this, we have a society that has little people like this chimney sweeper, a little black thing above the snow. And, and so he contrasts black and white. And in the drawing, he contrasts black and white as well. We see snow, rain, and a little black uh, chimney sweeper. Now, this is actually a Caucasian person, but he's black because he's been the soot of the chimney here. He's crying, weep, weep, and with notes of woe. And that's the kid is too young to even say the word sweep. He's really saying weep, but Blake is 
indicating that he is sad as well. <clears throat> he says, the poet says to the child, where are their father and their mother? And he says, they've gone up to the church to pray. Instead of being with him, they've abandoned him to go to the church to pray. And, and Blake wouldn't see organized religion or the church itself. Blake would say that that's not the place you can find God. You should find God in the eyes of little children. That's where you can find God, more so than in the church itself, because the church is corrupt, according to Blake. Because I was happy upon the heath, and I smiled among the winter snow, they clothed me in the clothes of death and taught me to sing the notes was. So the parents, they saw the kid was happy and healthy, so they put him in these clothes um, and in order to get more money. And because I'm happy and dance and sing, they think they've done me no injury. So they don't think they've done anything of harm to him. They don't realize, they don't know about lung cancer at the time. Uh, <clears throat> so they think they've done them no injury and are gone to praise God and his priest and king who make up a heaven of our misery. So uh, Blake is criticizing the church uh, who, you know, Instead of helping these little people who are suffering like this right here, uh, they're uh, making their own heaven out of these children's misery, that they're gaining economic gain out of things like that. The people go and give tithes and stuff like that. So it's a criticism of the modern church. And y'all can stop me if you want to add anything, if y'all want to add anything at this point or later. Here we have another poem that kind of ties into that. Holy Thursday, is this a holy thing to see? This one's from Songs of Experience as well. Uh, <clears throat> he asks, is this a holy thing to see in a rich and fruitful land, babes reduced to misery, fed with cold and usurious hand? So usury is like interest, uh, and the banks charge interest. Uh, and sometimes, uh, especially in this time, there would be exorbitant interest. If people ever got a loan, they would just be stuck in that loan, and then people would be thrown in debtor's prison. There were places like that, or it's sent to Australia in a land of exile because they were in debt. And all of this is for something, money, which is something that is not natural. It's not something that is born of God's natural creation. Is that a crumbling cry or a song? Can it be a song of joy and so many children poor? It is a land of poverty. So now he's criticizing England, which is a land of poverty. And it's not because it's a land of poverty just because of economically. It's a land of moral poverty, according to Blake. And their sun does never shine and their fields are bleak and bare and their ways are filled with thorns. It is eternal winter there. Yeah, uh, thanks, Michaela. Uh, that was kind of my purpose here. I think you can, if you look at these poems, I, I think that you can't see them one without the other. And I don't think Blake intended us to see them one without the other because Blake felt that our life is a life of contraries. Um, <clears throat> and every bit of joy is a bit of woe as well. And so when you see these two poems together, uh, when you're analyzing them in your uh, writing, I hope that you're looking at both of them there and showing how they feed off of one another. <clears throat> you see, and, and then look at the images of this poem. We got a dead child here, and then we got a mother or an angel, um, and then we got someone comforting someone who's suffering here. So sorrow is a bad thing, but like I talked about the frontispiece of the songs of experience, the thing about sorrow and grief is that it's a way for us to care for one another and to bring us out of this. And that human connection is what can bring us back and forth. That's what's necessary to overcome the ills of society. Now, Blake is, does not feel that all of these things have to continue to be. White doesn't feel that chimney sweepers continue to have to be this way. White doesn't feel that 
little children have to be abused or animals continue to have to be abused or uh, people of color have to be seen as less than people of you know white skin for instance and i'm going to take a look at a poem in a moment that talks about that as well blake thinks that there can be a better society and that's why i shared that poem uh jerusalem So <clears throat> this poem is famous because in World War I, uh, the English uh, were singing it as kind of like a fight song to hope uh, that there can be a better world. Uh, <clears throat> but when you read this poem, especially in contrast with London, we see uh, a poet who hopes to build a better world, who hopes to make this world a better place, like a new Jerusalem. Um, <clears throat> and how can we do that? How can we make a better world? Uh, well, first off, looking at the second stanza right here, he's talking about England, and he asks, is heaven here among these satanic mills? And this is where he criticizes industrial society the most in this line right here. He calls industrial factories satanic because they're built to make something that is inhuman. It's making cars and machinery and stuff like that. Machinery is lifeless. These things are inhuman. It is not in our nature to make inanimate objects. It is in our nature to make living things better. Uh, <clears throat> and so living our whole lives in machinery is something that dehumanizes us. And so, he hopes to create a better world, and Blake really loves the creative force. He says, bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's queen. So he says, you got to fight mentally. you got to fight physically. This is one reason why he loved America and the French Revolution, because he saw in these two places revolutions that were freeing people from authoritarian regimes that were abusing people, and they were making a way of their own, of the people, by the people, for the people. And this is why he loves these new places. So let me touch on a few of the other poems just briefly that we talked about because we got 15 minutes left and I want to start trying to tie things up a little bit more. Uh, we have the chimney sweeper, the other compendium uh, chimney sweeper poem. Uh, so it's not all sickness and death, okay? The, in this poem right here, we see a little kid who is sad at the beginning, uh, my father sold me while yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, weep, weep. To your chimneys I sweep, and in soot I sleep. Uh, now, that's not the end of the story, though, because there are other little chimney sweepers, these little children. Tom Dacre, uh, <clears throat> he helps the kid. He makes him feel better about his experience. <clears throat> uh he had this dream, and then there's an angel who comes by and helps him feel better. He, oh, the, the angel comes and opens the coffins and set them free in their dreams. So in their dreams, angels of mercy come to set little children free. Dreams are a type of vision, and Blake loved creative vision because it freed us from the constraints of reality. And in the case here, a dream is a type of creative vision that can free us of the constraints of modern industrial awful reality so the angel sets them free and lets them laugh and play like children should be playing naturally um, <clears throat> and the angel told tom if he'd be a good boy he'd have god for his father and never want joy and so tom awoke and we raised in the dark and <clears throat> can't read all of that though the morning was cold tom was happy and warm 
So if all do their duty, they need not feed harm, fear harm. So these dreams sent by angels of mercy, or God, if you will, comfort people in their sickness and sadness, because God is a God of comfort. Uh, <clears throat> and we can help each other as well. That's our purpose, to be like God, to comfort one another in the same way that Jesus comfort, comforted the little children and the sick and the weary and all those people, instead of the people who were in charge. And tying back to what I was talking about, about why Blake loved Christ so much, is because Christ wasn't on the side of the religious leaders in charge. As a matter of fact, he fought very much against them, the Pharisees of the time, those folks who said that to be like God, you have to follow this rule and this rule and this rule. And Blake hated rules uh, or an authority. He hated schools. He thought that schools indoctrinated people to be a certain type of way. And, and so uh, <clears throat> that's why uh, Blake liked the doctrine of Christ, like in the Beatitudes, the meek shall inherit the earth. Okay, the poor are the ones who are going to be in charge one day. Blake liked the Beatitudes and things like that, those doctrines. But at the same time in this poem, there's a subtle hint. <clears throat> now, some people say this poem says that we should really do our duty and be obedient and all of these things, and we won't fear harm. There's a subtle hint there because people who read this poem, especially when you read the chimney sweeper poem right there, know that these children, if they do their duty, will indeed suffer. Okay? They know that they will die. But at the same time, these words do comfort the little kid and get him through these hardships that can't be otherwise avoided. So seen with the eyes of experience, this innocence it we, we we know why they have it, you know, but this is how they get through these things. Okay. <clears throat> the Tiger is another poem that celebrates the creative energies, creative spirit, and this one should be read with the lamb. Uh, keep in mind that in the lamb, this image of the lamb is in a lot of Blake's poetry, and a lamb is an innocent thing. Uh, it, it's a lamb is pretty stupid when when you know a lot about a lamb. Um, I mean, when we talk about Psalm twenty three, he leads me beside the still waters. Because a lamb, if a lamb is drinking from water that's not still, a lamb his nose is so close to its mouth it can drown because it's kind of dumb. So, uh, <clears throat> but at the same time, that's an aspect of innocence. Okay, it's kind of ignorant, right? It needs something to take care of it, okay? Uh, and the tiger here, the tiger is something also that's been created by God. So God doesn't only create innocent, sweet, little, uh, harmless things. God creates these things as well. And really what he's celebrating is the creative spirit, and God is the creator, okay? The ultimate creator. Um, and this creative spirit uh, is represented how strong and powerful it can be is represented by this tiger right here it's dreadful and it's powerful and the creator has to be um, powerful and daring in order to um, you know create the tiger to create something in the same way we Blake seems to imply who wish to create a better society like a new Jerusalem have to be creative we have to be daring we have to be bold we have to be dangerous. So it's like he's encouraging a revolution in a sense, in the same way, like the French Revolution. I think there was one other poem that I briefly mentioned, and that's The Little Black Boy. This isn't one that I had y'all to read, but it's uh, a part of Songs of Experience and Songs of Innocence, and you can read it if you want to. Uh, but it occurred to me that th it, it fell along the lines of saying that Animals are just like us, even though they don't have reason. Remember that Blake isn't part of the Enlightenment. He's moving forward from that. Uh, Enlightenment figures like Kant said that animals are not, we, we should be able to use them for food and things like that. Uh, and, you know, they're not as good as humans. They're not equal to humans. 
He said this because they don't have reason, okay? Uh, but Blake isn't as concerned with reason. Um, in this poem right here, he talks about the need for racial equality as well. He says, my mother bore me in the Southern wild and I am black, but oh, my soul is white. I'm white as an angel is the English child, but I am black as if bereaved by light, but that doesn't mean that I'm not full of light. And looking at the rest of this poem right here, at the end of the poem, uh, it, it gives a subtle hope that one day uh, people of black and white races can be uh, you know, the same. And Blake hated slavery as well. He said, when I from black and he from white cloud free and round the tent of God like lambs we joy. So he says, one day we're both not going to have any color at all. We're going to be equal. We're going to join around God like lambs. I'll shade him from the heat till he can bear to lean in joy upon our father's knee. And then I'll stand and stroke his silver hair when he's old and be like him. And he will then love me. So there's a subtle hint of how good the world can be if there's racial equality there as well. Okay, I think that gets us toward the end of most of these poems here. Is there anything anybody else wants to talk about or something that confused you in some of these poems here? Anything anybody wants to add? <clears throat> 